Before we start, I would like to ask your help to hit the like button, hit the subscribe, and smash the bell. Smash like hawk. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this exclusive antenatal webinar organized by Hali, aimed to help you prepare to care for your newborn child. So today we are extremely fortunate to have two speakers to share their knowledge with us. So first up, we have Dr. Lo Ka Pin, who will be speaking on fibroid and cysts during your pregnancy. After that, we will have Juan Mazni, who will be speaking on the importance of bonding time with your baby. So please be reminded, participants can ask questions as well. We will be accepting questions throughout the whole session via chat. Okay, so um, today my topic is about fibroid and ovarian cysts in pregnancy. Thank you all for tuning in and listening. Um, if you have any question, you all can type in or you can just ask along the way, okay? Alright, so first off, um, by my side, I can hear some echoing of my own uh, voice. Maybe it's my program, maybe. Alright, so uh, in the four menu, Today, the menu for today is uh, four things um, ovarian cysts, pregnancy with ovarian cysts, fibroids, pregnancy, and fibroids. Okay, so. Okay, first off, I'm going to talk about uh, ovarian cysts. Um, before I talk about ovarian cysts, we talk about ovary, okay? So, this is the female uh, genital tract, okay? And you can see below here, this is the vagina. All right, and this is the womb or the uterus, and from here we can see there's a small like hand-like features. Okay, this is called the fallopian tubes, and this is the ovary. So basically, uh, to get pregnant, the ovary will produce uh, the eggs, okay, or the ovum, and it will go to the fallopian tubes, okay. And this is the area where the tubes meet the sperm. So the sperm basically need to swim out from the vagina. Towards, this is the uh, womb opening which is called cervix and it go up to the womb and it go to the tube and it meets the eggs and it becomes the baby, the embryo and it roll down into the womb. So pregnancy is in the womb, okay? And the cyst, cyst basically is like a big fill sac, right? So anything that you fill with water and a sac or a balloon is actually we call it a cyst. So when I talk about ovarian cyst, so it's a cyst, it's a fluid filled sac in the ovary. Because a lot of times, a lot of people will be asking me a lot about cysts. They were talking about uh, kidney cysts, liver cysts. No, I'm talk not talking about all these you know, other cysts. Okay? I'm talking specifically on this uh, cyst on the ovary. Alright, so ovarian cysts. Okay, so before we talk about ovarian cysts, there's actually two type of, uh, I mean two main type, okay? But the basically the one that is very common, common means that every ladies have it, alright? If you can see in the picture here, right? Um, the side here, can you see the arrow here? Alright, so this is the egg, alright? And the egg will start from very small and will become very big. And then when it becomes the biggest, then the egg will ovulate. Ovulate means that you release, the sac will release the egg into the tube I mentioned just now. And then the sac, it will form something yellowish like here, which is called the luteal sac, correct? So what is the importance of uh, showing uh, this picture here? Okay, the reason is because this is called, the sac before it ovulates is called follicle. And the sac after it ovulates is called here, all right. So this follicle, if it's filled with a lot of water, actually it can become a cyst. So this is one of the common cysts that patients will have, all right. And this is a very uh, how to say this is a cyst that will go by itself, and sometimes you don't need any medication, don't need any surgery, all right. This is called follicular cyst. And if the sac from the yellowish become if filled with water, then it become fluteal sac. All right. Okay. So, so for the ladies, when you get pregnant, before your baby develops the placenta, 
this loot here this will become bigger and bigger okay but not very big okay the reason it become big is because this luteal sac contain a hormone this hormone is a progesterone hormone which is important to help the baby progress in early stage of pregnancy okay As for the uncommon seeds, we have three types, all right? One is the chocolate seeds. Another one is a mucinous seeds. And the last one would be the, uh, what we call as a dermoid seeds, okay? So, what do we mean by chocolate seeds? Okay, chocolate seeds is when, um, the most common theory they are saying is that uh, most ladies, they have period, then they are they pump period, but some period will go into the tummy and it will form chocolate seeds. All right. As for mucinous and dermoid, it's just a spontaneous seed that comes from the ovary. Some of the cells, it becomes abnormal and it forms a cyst. And this kind of cyst sometimes it look very, um, very scary because the dermoid seeds, they'll be hair, they'll be gum, they'll be cooked. But then, uh, if it's uh, what we call a mature dermoisis, it's not it's not cancerous and it will be removed. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So okay. Um, okay. I'll go further. All right. So what happens if you have ovarian cysts in pregnancy? Okay. So when you see uh, ovarian cysts, okay. As you can see, there's a photo here. There's a Avenger. Okay. I'm not mistakenly put a photo here okay basically i put this photo to remind everyone that when you have a cyst during pregnancy it won't affect your baby okay it won't affect your baby all right so what uh, we will affect is because uh, we look at three things okay first thing is will it be cancerous right to have an ovarian cyst becoming a cancer in pregnancy is extremely rare so usually we will do an ultrasound to see whether it's a solid component and we do the blood test to get any tumor markers that is a marker whether this is cancer or alright but usually it's not okay what we are afraid of during uh, a pregnancy for ovarian cysts is whether to have accidents okay what I mean by accidents is not like you no know, motor car accident or you bump into something accident okay accident means that Okay, can you see the photo here? It's a balloon, right? All right. So this balloon, basically, um, is like a cyst. So this cyst, if when you're pregnant, if you got rupture or bleeding or tw twisted, then you have very severe pain and you have a lot of bleeding. So when you develop this accident, then you need to do a surgery immediately to remove the cyst and also to repair the bleeding. Okay, so this is uh, relatively uncommon, okay, unless the cyst is very big and very mobile. So usually it's not common, but it depends on the type of cyst that you have, right? And it can happen at any time. Okay, sometimes the cyst can rupture during the first trimester, the first three months, sometimes the second three months, sometimes the third three months, all right? And the third thing is uh, obstruction, which is more rare, okay? Obstruction is when, uh, as you can see, this is the pregnant womb. As it goes bigger and bigger, it needs to go down into the vaginal tract. So if, let's say, the cyst is very big and it somehow push the baby head sideways. So if it's sideways, the baby cannot deliver normally. So what I mean by obstruction is this. Push the baby head towards one side and it cannot go down and deliver normally. So, at that stage of time, we cannot do any uh, other, uh, we cannot do anything about the cyst because the baby head already at the side. So usually, that kind of situation with a surgery cesarean section, and at the same time, remove the cyst. Okay. Uh, all right. So, what can we do when you have ovarian cysts in pregnancy? Basically, there is no medication that we can actually give to 
to relieve the the cyst, right? Uh, some people they believe in giving this uh, hormonal contraception pill, but studies have shown that it's not actually helpful, right? What what I mean is that praying means that you just uh, conservative, and usually you become smaller. Okay? Especially I uh, want mentioned the luteal cyst in first three months of pregnancy, it's slowly becoming small. But if it keep on becoming big, then um, the doctor and the lady and the couple must decide whether you want to do surgery to remove the cyst. And then the remove the cyst you can do it uh, what we call as keyhole surgery. It means we just do three holes, all right, and we just uh, go from there and we remove the cyst. So this is one of the way to remove it by keyhole. Okay? This is a keyhole surgery that I've done uh, for dermoid cyst. Uh, you, you can click on the QR if you like to to see the video of the remover, but this is not during pregnancy, okay? And the second thing, of course, is to do it uh, open. Open means you do a small incision, you take it. And usually, if you do open, you can do it at any uh, stage of pregnancy, but usually we prefer to do it in the second trimester, means the mid three months, okay? Because at the mid three months, um, the uh, baby already developed all the features, okay? And very rare to have a uh, risk of risk of miscarriage there, even though we don't do anything or we do anything there. So we usually avoid the first three months. And then the second three months is the one that's more stable. And the last three months is where we have if we trigger wrongly anytime we can have a uh, miscarriage. Okay. So you can see from here, this is one of the uh, open surgery where this is the ovary and this is the cyst and then the remove of the cyst and you suture the remaining of the ovary together. Alright? Okay. So, so some of you uh, a lot of patients when I talk about surgery during pregnancy, um, a lot of people are a bit uh, like surprised that during surgery, during pregnancy we can do surgery. So this is one of my presentation in our conference and I'm just collecting a few uh, case reports that I do uh, for patients with uh, ovarian cysts and these are three ladies that I did uh, surgery for ovarian cysts mainly the cyst is very big and then some of the cysts have uh, solid components so uh, we worry about compression, we worry about this uh, as well so, these are the three uh, ladies that I did for the uh, cystectomy during pregnancy. Um, you can see that here, one of them are mucinous cysts. The second one is a teratoma or the deformed cyst where it contains a fat, hair, and some tooth. And the last one, the endometrioma, is a chocolate cyst. The size of the first cyst is around 13 cm. The second one is 9.5, the biggest diameter. The third one is 7 cm. Um, the first lady de uh, delivered by vacuum. The second lady developed by uh, normal vaginal degree. And the third one had to go for Caesar because of uh, other reasons unrelated to the six. Okay, at the point of this report, uh, two of the ladies they haven't delivered yet. So the the data wasn't entered to make my presentation. Okay. Alright, so um, before I go on, any question from the crowd? Um, don't worry, doctor. We'll be uh, okay. asking questions at the end, yeah? Alright, can go through. I'll just continue first. Alright. Okay, so second thing I'm talking about is fibroid. Alright, so fibroid is basically, as you can see here, there is a this is the normal, in your left here, this is the normal womb, alright? Okay, this is the womb, the wall of the womb, the line of the womb, and this is the ovary, the tube, okay? And this is the, the womb with a lot of fibroid. As you can see, fibroid, they are uh, muscular growth in the womb, okay? And they can be at a lot of area, okay? For instance, if you look here, this is the neck of the womb. They can be at the neck of the womb. They can be in between the neck of the womb and the womb. They can be inside the womb. They can be in the wall of the womb. They can be behind, in front, on top, and some also can get 
pedunculated means that it's like there's an extension of the, uh, outside of the womb and there's one more that's outside over around here as well okay so um, maybe I make this uh, session a bit more interactive okay uh, let me uh, I cannot see the chat box uh. is there a chat box I can see uh, yes, doctor, oh, there's, there's a no chat box. Uh, All right, can the participant type? No? Uh, yes, participants can type, but uh, be, because we would prefer to keep the Q&A session uh, after your presentation, so okay, maybe we okay. can keep then, the interaction. Then I, mm. I don't make it interactive, huh? All right. So, yep. oh, okay. <laughs> So usually I interact by having the participant type in the chat box so I can interact with the uh, participant, okay? So, so you like ladies guess, okay? How many ladies actually have fibroid? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Alright, okay? The answer is actually seven, alright? Out of ten ladies, seven of the guys have uh, fibroid. Means that here, the participant is around 30 ladies, okay? So 30 ladies, uh, I see 31 now, but I'm not sure whether it's all ladies. Alright, so out of these 30 ladies, 7 means that 21 of you guys have fibroid. It's just that not everyone with fibroid will need attention, okay? Means that uh, out of 4 ladies with fibroid, only 1 require medication or uh, operation, okay? Okay, sorry. Hello, doctor. Are you there? That you should uh, avoid to be researchers of oh, twelve uh, risk factors, and there's sorry, two doctor, risk factors uh, that ingestion. Come. Okay, mainly is a food preservative. Okay, food preservative means that if you take anything that is not fresh, then the fibroid may grow and it increase three times. Second thing is soy bean milk. Okay, it increased one five times. So for me, I usually advise patients, uh, mothers that like soybean related food also it may increase your fibroid, uh, one point five times. Means that if let's say you have fibroid with or without pregnancy, you must try to avoid uh this kind of uh preservative. Okay. All right. So the next, the last thing in the menu is uh, fibroid and pregnancy, okay? So, as you can see, another photo of Avengers here, alright? So it means that if you have fibroid in pregnancy, you won't affect the baby, okay? The baby won't turn into Spider-Man or Superman, okay? You're just a normal baby, alright? However, uh, you can see that, okay, so you can see this picture here, alright? So fibroid in pregnancy, it may affect ways okay for instance um, you can see the fibroid if let's say it's here the baby is up here so the uh, cervical or the of the womb is down here means the fibroid is blocking the ten of the baby all right so uh, in pregnancy it's fibroid pregnancy rather than cyst because fibroid um you cannot do operation because it's part of the womb and the womb is like the house of the baby if you do the surgery then it may affect the house of the baby okay so if there's a fibroid very low near the cervix then mostly what it causes is obstruction okay obstruction is that the baby cannot deliver normally if the fibroid is higher which is on top of the baby, I mean on top of the womb, then the normally, alright? Then some people worry that, oh, I have a fibroid, I have a baby, we are in like, you no know, cramp up the baby, baby got no place to uh, grow, 
actually um, the cramping of baby is quite rare. I have seen one uh, one particular uh, patient before when I was in a uh, government service where the mother have extremely huge fibroid. Okay, it's so huge, like like almost uh, like a baby at nine months. So it's like it fill up the tummy almost up to the uh, up above the umbilicus. So at that point, she's pregnant. Which is a miracle because usually you have fibroid, uh, a bit difficult to get pregnant, all right? And the baby is small and the baby is growing as well. So at that stage, yes, because the fibroid is extremely big at the beginning, means once she knows that she's pregnant, it's already very big and it may compress and may I mean, will stop the baby from the pain. So at that point, um, there's few things that may happen. If it's the first three months, it may have miscarriage. If it's the second or third three months, then it may have to be called an uh, quick. It may also have slight bleeding. So this is also a worry, okay? Because when the placenta is at the fibroid, it will bleed. And when it bleed, it may also maybe life-saving move that we do. okay all right yeah i can see the chat here all right oh okay Uh, doctor, you may have to repeat uh, oh, what you said a little see. earlier. Hello? Okay. You are... Doctor, you may have to repeat what you said a little earlier, yeah? Because we lost you a little bit halfway. When you were talking about the previous slide. Oh, can you hear? Yeah, uh, doctor, you can you repeat starting uh, where from the are uh, you talking about the uh, what happens in the second and third trimester? Uh. Okay, I repeat again. Okay, can you all hear me now? All right. Yes. Okay, I repeat again. So basically, uh, when you have a fibroid in pregnancy, um, if it's below the baby, then it will cause obstruction. Okay. For instance, if you can see the 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 picture here, the fibroid is at is between the baby and the neck of the womb. If it's between, then the baby cannot uh, descend and then it will cause uh, obstruction and it cannot get deliver normally. And then the, the problem with this fibroid, um, we cannot really do the operation in the pregnancy because this, uh, this, this womb is like the house of the baby. If the house of the baby is like, you know, we, we disturb it, then it may affect pregnancy, okay? 
So continue. Um, so for this fibroid, if it's uh, very near the placenta, sometimes the placenta becoming uh, not very uh, stable, so it cause bleeding. So this bleeding may also cause uh, miscarriage in the first three months. If it's a second or third treatment, it may cause uh, what we call as a preterm birth. Preterm birth that is like the baby haven't reached the term and it start to bleed, and it may cause early delivery. So this is the danger with having fibroid. But most of the patients with fibroid, they are uh, uh, they won't cause very much harm. And then usually the decision is whether to remove the fibroid during the caesarean section. Okay. Okay. So this is one of the my personal patient. Okay, this patient, um, this is the first photo. If you see, this is the baby at twelve weeks. So at twelve weeks, the baby actually have. A, can you see here? This is a very gray area here. And this gray area is where I mean the placenta. So this placenta behind it is a fibroid, and this fibroid is the number one fibroid. Okay. All right, so and during because of the fibroid is at the lower area, the, my patient cannot deliver normal, so she need to go for cesarean section. And the thing about this patient is because she when she's pregnant at around uh, 14 or 15 weeks, start to have bleeding because the placenta is near the fibroid, and this bleeding is just a bit, but it's very annoying, and she's a and we are both also worried and she keep on bleeding like every almost every two to three days and then um, but this is very small bleed and somehow the baby um, is being uh, I mean the pregnancy progresses well and then the baby grow until around eight nine months because of the cushion or less food for the baby the growth has uh, stopped slightly, okay? But at that time when the growth has stopped, the baby is actually quite big, more than two kilo, all right? So at that point, we did a cesarean, I did a cesarean section and I delivered the baby. And before the delivery, of course, before baby having gone to term, so I need to give the baby some uh, medication to make it, uh, make it uh, baby mature the lungs, the brain, all right. And then during the surgery itself, I removed the fibroid. And can you see the fibroid one? This is the big fibroid that is causing all the bleeding. And at the same time, I see there's a fibroid number two, number three, number four, number five, and number six. I remove it all together, all right. So um, the whole age thing is like a lot of people they do not dare to do uh, fibroid removal during cesarean section because. Basically, when during cesarean, your whole womb is very big. So, it caused the uh, increase of the deep. However, but if you do it properly, sometimes you wait very vigilantly, uh, it may not increase the baby. Okay. And for that, I actually also presented some of my case series. I mean, a patient that I've uh, done uh, this fibroid removal during the teaser. Okay, so these are the three ladies that have done a uh, cesarean section. Okay, the first lady is uh, you try fibroid at the lower side that at the blocking the half of the surgery. Second one is the uh, mother is subfertile. I mean, she tried to get pregnant more than two years, but not so she got pregnant and she got a lot of fibroids. And the last one is fetal macrosomia, means that the big baby her baby is uh, 4.3 kilo. Okay. The first lady, the fibroid is around 15 cm. So this lady, the, 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 the difficulty or the challenge of this the fibroid must be removed in addition to delivery means that I use up 22 minutes to remove the fibroid before the baby is being delivered and the total 
and pre-op HP means the red cell is around 10.7 and post-op after day 2 is 10.2 so actually the return loss is not that much okay for the other ladies the second and the third um, they are, they are the, their cesarean section is easier because I, I deliver the baby first before I do the fibroid removal and the time also go around one hour not more than one so the the take home message is that uh, fibroid can be removed during the cesarean section itself. However, um, it depends on where the fibroid is. If the fibroid is at the lower part of the womb, then you can remove it without affecting the next pregnancy uh, matter. Upper part of the womb. Your next pregnancy, your next delivery, you need to be a cesarean section. But if this pregnancy is cesarean section and the fibroid is a lower segment, at the lower area, and you do your next pregnancy, you still try for normal delivery. Okay. So uh okay so if let's say you do not want to remove i mean so let's say the mother uh is not suitable to remove i mean doesn't need cesarean section or you don't remove the fibroid during pregnancy you can actually opt for removal of the fibroid after delivery maybe uh, after preferably after one or two months or before you get pregnant okay so, what are the options of removing the fibroid? It can be done from keyhole as well. Like this is one of my patients who has a 6x7 uh, CM fibroid. Okay, this is before and this is after. This is the womb after the fibroid removed. Okay, and then I can done, do it through keyhole. Okay, keyhole means that you can see here there's three small like keyhole size incision where the whole fibroid will be put in a bag and from that bag I'll be cutting it into small slices and removing it through the small hole. Right? So when we do this keyhole surgery, uh, the patient will go back with less pain and then uh, we'll have less adhesion or scarring inside the tummy so the patient can have minimal effect towards his fertility. Right? Okay, so I hope that the small glitch of internet connection wouldn't affect my uh, delivery or presentation. And I've shared about ovarian cysts, pregnancy with ovarian cysts, fibroid, pregnancy with fibroid. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, yeah. Doctor. Any for that question? Uh, yes, Doctor, can you hear me now? Yep, yep. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much, doctor, for the very informational session. So now we're going to start the Q&A session, right? Yep. So we already have a few questions coming in. So the first one is, presentation, you mentioned that uh, when fibroid ruptures, there will be bleeding. No, not fibroid, so, cyst, cyst rupture. Uh, cyst, yes, cyst ruptures, there will be bleeding. Um, yep. So in this case, how will how will the mummies know if there has been uh, a ruptured cyst? Will will the blood come out like a period, or will there be some other kinds of symptoms? Ah, uh, it will become like uh usually is the cyst. If it's cyst rupture, you will have bleeding when you have, and the mother cannot walk, cannot every cannot cannot. Uh, cannot walk. Usually, what I do, what I do, my personally, I look for a sign. Okay, this sign I call it smiling sign. Means that it's so painful that the ladies cannot smile. Means that uh, it's really uh, bleeding inside. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. Wow, so painful. So it doesn't. Can't... The blood, the blood doesn't come out from the vagina because it's inside the tummy. The tummy and the womb is a different uh, cavity itself. All right, so mummies will not be able to know unless it's very, very painful, right? Uh, yes. Usually, okay. if they have slight pain, then they will come to hospital. Mm. All right, okay. Thank you, doctor, for the explanation. Yeah. 
So okay. our next question is, yep. uh, can fibroid be? Hmm, sorry. Any other okay. question? Uh, so, yes. Our next question is, can fibroid be removed together with cesarean section? Yes, like mentioned just now, the fibroid can be to bring the section and I show uh, there's four, uh, three of my ladies that are discussion with the couple. If the fibroid is below and the womb is very big, so we have upper segment and lower segment. If it's affect the method of delivery in next pregnancy again, she still can deliver normally your next pregnancy. But if the fibroid is on top and we remove, there'll be weakness of the womb on top. So if the weakness of the womb on top, her next pregnancy will need to be caesarean section and cannot be uh, trial of normal delivery. And then sometimes we look at the fibroid, whether is it near the vessel. So this is the womb. The vessel is usually at the side. Some fibroid is sits very near to the vessel and the vessel is sometimes very huge. If really the vessel is very huge, there's very high risk of bleeding, then we won't remove the fibroid. So removal of fibroid at the end is look at the benefit versus risk. So if the risk is higher than the benefit, we won't remove. If the benefit is more than the risk, we will remove it during the caesarean section. Okay, all right. Thank you, doctor. Um, so mm. our next question is, if there is a, if there are cysts during pregnancy, and, you, yeah. and uh, the mommy wants to get it removed, how long will the wound take to recover? And in that case, is it a must to get cesarean section or does she still have a chance to give birth naturally? Forget the question. Means that this is a fibroid in pregnancy. Uh, for, or for cysts. If, if the mummy has cysts during pregnancy. Okay. And anytime during the pregnancy, she wants to remove it. How long yeah. does it take to heal? Oh, usually the, the healing is around four weeks four weeks so uh, usually we do it in the second trimester means second three months of the pregnancy and once the cyst is removed then she, she, she will just heal as its own and then the pregnancy will progresses at itself and then she can have a normal vagina birth doesn't require a cesarean section uh, if I just go through my slides uh, this is the slides, okay? You can see that the first lady delivered by vacuum, vagina delivery, the second one is by uh, vagina delivery. Yep. All right, doctor. Thank you for the uh, thank, you. thank you for the explanation. Hello. Uh, so our our next question is uh, if is it normal for ladies to have Hello. fibroid? Pretty common. Like I mentioned, out of ten ladies, seven have fibroid, and out of these seven, means that uh, only one in four having the symptom of fibroid. So maybe if you take an eight, only two ladies out of ten have a uh, symptom. So uh, the other uh, five or six ladies, they'll have no symptom at all. Usually fibroid, you have a uh, very heavy bleeding, painful bleeding, and sometimes it disturb your urine or bowel habit. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, doctor. So, okay, so having shortened period uh, is normal for ladies with, uh, with fibroids. Okay, thank you, understood. Um, yeah. So, actually, there's also uh, a concerned mummy who says that during her pregnancy, her the fibroid growth is very fast. It, it grows in size. So, should she be worried okay. or is this normal? What's like, uh, what my, my patient, the sound that I mentioned, she has, uh, she has, where is it not here? She has bleeding. So, it is bleeding very little. 
saying nothing is not 100 okay i've seen uh literature literature means some journal that some people we call degeneration it becomes something strong and it like very it's strong and it, it contract when it contract it become very painful this is called fibroid degeneration so when it become very painful um it need a surgery and if let's say the the very severe pain which is not controlled by any painkiller some surgeon uh actually go in and we move the fibroid during pregnancy for our participants um who still have our uh, still have more questions who didn't have a chance to ask doctor your questions regarding cysts and fibroids during pregnancy please feel free to reach out to him on his social media you can find dr low on his youtube at dr kp low gaini pening at dr k p l o w gaini pening or on his Facebook, Instagram, Twitter as Gaini Pinning. So if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to him on his social media. Um and also uh do stay tuned for a live demonstration on how to oh uh, doctor is back. Uh, there we go. Uh, so you can reach out to you can reach out to doctor uh, uh, my, on his sorry, social media here. Yeah, uh doctor, we we're we're ending the Q&A yes. session because we're also running out of time. So yeah, I've asked so the I've asked the participants to uh find you on social media so you and, have and, all right. the YouTube. Okay, you. Sorry for the interruption. No, it's fine. It's okay. All right. So Bye. uh get participant, you can find him on his uh, his YouTube and his other social media if you have additional questions. So, thank you so much, doctor. Um thank you so much for your time and making it the time to explain this very common but important topic that isn't talked about enough or with our mummies over here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. So for our participants do stay tuned for a live demonstration on how to spend quality bonding time with your baby and give them a good bath that will be hosted by Juan Madni. All right, welcome back to Huggy's exclusive antenatal webinar. And now we will have a demonstration on proper bathing techniques hosted by Juan Mazni. So Juan Mazni is a hospital play consultant with University Kebangsaan Malaysia Medical Center and is also currently the president of the president of International Association of Infant Massage Malaysian chapter. So Juan Mazni, uh, are you ready? Just give her a moment. Juan Matni, are you there? Yes, I am here. Can you hear All me? Right. All right. Sorry, yes, I just we can hear you. Now. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. So right, now, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so okay. should give the, the baby some privacy, right, while they are yeah. bathing? <laughs> yeah. Okay. The All right. Please, for, please for go ahead first. with your demonstration. Okay. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. All right. Okay, um, before I start, I would like to congratulate the mummies and daddies for your new arrival, right? And hygiene is um, absolutely important now. You know, it's, a, it's an important aspect of baby care and a daily bath is essential to keep your baby clean and fresh, especially during this pandemic, right? You can bathe your baby anytime, but uh, it is advisable to do so before you before a feed, right? Before you feed your baby, bathing your baby too soon after a feed can cause your baby to be uncomfortable and can spit up milk, right? So if 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 this is your first time bathing your little one, you will probably feel anxious, but with constant practice, you will gain confidence, and your baby will get used to bath time and enjoy it. Most boy, most babies um, find warm water, soothing, and a bath will help a fussy baby to relax and calm down. Okay? For new parents, it will be an experience 
you should not miss and work together with your spouse to create bonding with your baby. Now, during this, um, what we call as EMCO, I don't know how many of you are affected with EMCO, but um, you, you will have more time, uh, more like together time, more of your time with your baby, right? And one of it will be a uh, bathing time. So for bathing, I just switch my camera. Right. Okay, for bathing, you need a bathtub, right? A jug of warm water. Cool boiled water. Cotton wool balls. Alcohol swap, bin or plastic bag okay, to contain your salt cotton wool balls, okay. face cloth, towel, baby clothes, diapers, and for today uh, I'll be using Hardy's diapers. and baby wrap yeah. it is a good idea to prep your baby for the baby for the bathing session okay, by talking to the baby what will happen while the mother is talking to the baby the father could help up by arranging the aforementioned items for the bathing session right and remember before you handle your baby wash yourself first if you come up, if you just get back from work or shop or anything, any activities outside the house, make sure you bathe first before you handle your baby, right? And remember, never leave your baby unattended during bathing time, okay? Right, um, we can bathe um, our baby in the baby's room, making sure that the room is at room temperature, meaning that there will be no fan, no air conditioning on because we are going to expose the baby right make sure the bathtub is placed on a firm surface okay fill the basin with cool water first okay we get the cool water up till about one third level of the tub and the ideal temperature of the water is between 32 uh, to 37 degrees Celsius. okay and then we have the warm water okay and you can use the baby um, the water thermometer that you can buy from any baby store or pharmacy for testing the temperature of the water. Mix the water well so that there will be no hot spots, right? If you don't have a thermometer, you can use your elbow to test the water, okay? The temperature of the water. And never do not use your fingers as they have they can withstand a much hotter temperature, right? Make sure um, it is comfortably warm and not too hot, right? And um, then we can start squeezing two drops of bath oil okay, into the water and mix them well. For, it, for babies, it's advisable not to use soap because it will, co it will cause um, skin dryness. Right? And place your baby on the bath towel and then the I just move my things to the side because I have only limited space for my baby. Right? Okay. So this is my baby today. <laughs> okay. So what what you do is that um, you place your baby on a bath towel and gently remove the vest. Okay. Remove your baby skin. Baby, it's your bathing time now. Talk to your baby as much as possible to prepare them that they're going to go. Oh yes. Another thing that I forgot is you wear watches or, or bracelets. Just remove them before you attend your baby. Yeah? Okay, just remove your baby's clothes. 
keep on the dye first because you're going to clean the face first. Okay, keep continue talking to your baby so that they feel reassured. Okay, and leave the diapers on and wrap the baby with the towel. Okay, keeping his hands and feet wrapped within the towel. Okay. You can see that, right? Okay. So, first and foremost, we have to dip the water. Sorry, I didn't dip. I just okay. First, we have to clean the baby's eyes. Okay, dip the cotton ball in a you know cool boiled water. Okay, and squeeze out the excess water. Squeeze out the excess water, okay, and clean your baby's eyes starting from the nose outwards to the outer side of the eye. Can you see it? Can you see that? You do that. And use another cotton ball. And then from the inside to the outside. I hope this is clear for you all. Okay, today. I don't have any assistance, so I'm, being, I'm running the show alone. <laughs> okay, do not clean back and forth like that. Okay, do not do that. Okay, because um, it will, uh, it's not good for the baby. Okay, and observe if there's any sticky or yellowish discharge around your baby's eye, please bring him to the doctor. Okay, if the discharge persists, okay, to clean it first. And if it continues to have that discharge, just bring the baby to the doctor. Okay? Then we will clean the baby's face. Wash the baby's face using the full water. And this time, I will show you using the um, uh, face cloth. Okay? So, from the center out. Okay, we will do that. And that. Okay, this other side. We will do that. This is what I'm doing at the moment. Okay, the forehead, okay. the nose, the cheek, okay, and also the mouth area. Right? So then we will start to wash your baby's hair. You carry your baby using a football hole. The football hole is when, with the palm of your hand supporting the head and the neck, right? And tucking him between your arms and the side of your body like that. I hope you can see this, okay? And tilt the baby's head. Tilt the baby's head like that, okay? I hope you see this, yeah? Um, over the uh, bath basin and wash his hair, right? Just wash his hair. Keep on talking to the baby. Okay, we're washing your hair now, right? And then dry his hair gently with the corner of your towel wrap. Okay, then place your baby back on the table to so unwrap him and remove his diaper. Okay. If your baby is soiled, clean his buttocks area with sweat non-alcohol wipes. Like... Yes, I'm using the Hadid uh, baby wipe. Yeah? Is it one? So remove the baby diaper. Remove the blind the binder. Okay. 
I need to say, is it the boy? Ta-da! It's the boy! So you clean that way. Make sure that you clean under the groin. Okay? And by the side. Alright? If it's a girl, you have to clean from up and downward. From the up to the back. Because girls tend to get uh, infections uh, more often than boys. Yeah? And then, um, and for boys, when you're doing that, you must make sure that you have a clean diaper on top of it. Just in case, um, uh, just in case they can uh, urinate anytime on you or the walls or anything nearby. Okay? And um, okay, when you took the diapers off, okay? And you will have the two diapers to the side. Okay. Right. Um, to carry the baby to the bus stop, okay, you will have to put your left hand under the baby's shoulder and support it and hook your fingers under the baby's arm feet like this. Okay? And then you will have to do a good grab and slide your right hand under the buttock and grip the baby tie and lift it, lift your baby to the bus stop. Make sure that you put the uh, the leg first, okay, before anything else and Maybe you're going to touch your water now, okay? Grab your baby and he will expect after that. What he will expect after that, eh? And make sure the baby sit touch the water first and allow your baby to sit in the tub, okay? With your left hand still supporting your baby's shoulders, okay? But keeping your baby's head above the water level, yeah? Then release your right hand and you start bathing the front part for baby and the private area okay you can also use the face cloth to do this okay wipe the face cloth and you can just wipe your baby like that okay stop and sing to your baby as your as your bathing them right to make sure that bath time will be enjoyable when you're done this him out of the water the same way you brought him in okay then before that, you have to move him to the other side so that you can clean his back. Like that. Okay. Alright, when you're done, you will lift him out of the water. The same way you drop him in. Place your baby gently on the towel and pat him dry. Okay. You pat them, do not wipe them. Okay. Pay attention to the skin folds and be sure to dry behind the ears, right? In between the fingers and toes, okay? Under his arm, his armpit. I think I better move it. Right. Before you dress up your baby, you just have a nice ready. Sorry, baby. Are you okay? Right before um, you dress him up, you have to clean the umbilical cord, right? The umbilical area. So you take one alcohol swab, then you clean under the umbilical area, right? The umbilical cord usually will 
um, drop of about five to seven days. Okay, if you notice if there's any bleeding or foul smelling discharges, you should be cleaning the cord and consult a, a doctor um, of if the system persists. Then we will start dressing up your baby. Okay, do not overdress your baby. You okay? Oh no, I got it wrong. <laughs> so remember when you want to put, especially for Huggies, it's so it's so easy when you have to when you use Huggies diapers because you have the back and this will be the front. When you have the Huggies name, that will be the front. Yeah. So I do it wrong just now. My bad. Okay. Okay. Right, for baby, um, we don't encourage mommy to put uh, what we call that baby powder, okay, because it might affect baby respiratory due to the inhalation of the fine. Uh, powder. Okay, cuddle your baby as often as possible to, reassure, to reassure them. Okay, as much as, as possible, um, you should encourage your child to take part in bathing your baby, and it is a wonderful opportunity for bonding. Yeah. Then, um, before you dress up your baby, what you can do is you can massage them. Okay? There are some benefits of infant massage. First. It uh, promotes interaction, it promotes stimulation, it promotes relaxation, and it also promotes relief. The interaction because during this time you can do bonding with your baby. Okay, you promote secure attachment, the one-to-one -one quality time with your baby, and this is a pre-language communication skill experience because you will talk a lot to your baby during the massage, right? For stimulation, it will help with the baby's circulatory system, the respiratory system, the growth of your baby. Okay, remember, your baby grows daily, even every minute they grow. So in order for them not to get sick, you know, like your bones are growing and everything is growing. So you need uh, some stimulation to make sure that they are not in pain. So the best stimulation for your baby is massage, right? And also for the mind and uh, body awareness, right? For relaxation, it will improve your baby's sleeping pattern. Okay? It will increase your baby's flexibility. It will uh, allow your baby to be calm, okay? And it will lower down the uh, stress hormone for you, for mothers, and also for the baby, right? And relief is when you um, it can release gas and calories. Okay? If you continuously uh, uh, massage your baby, uh, you will, uh, um, I mean, like you will, um, the baby will experience less colic, okay? And then um, they will have less pain for their, uh, they have, they will have less growing pain, okay? This uh, teething and less comfortable discomfort, okay? They will have less uh, pain for teething, and also it will help them with their constipation and also elimination, all right? So, and for today, I will teach you, um, I have been teaching face massage. I don't know, do we have time? Yeah. Um, I've been uh, teaching face massage all this while. Um, for today, I was thinking that I might do leg massage, right? Leg massage, um, I like to share leg massage because uh, we parents will deal a lot with the legs. You know, when you change your baby's diapers, you know, you will touch your baby's leg, right? So for leg massage, okay, for, and another thing when you want to start massaging is the oil, okay? You don't have to use all this um, minyak kayu putih or whatsoever. You just use things that you can eat, edible oil, okay? You can have any cook, your cooking oils or olive oil or grapefruit oil. So those oils that is edible um, so that it will, um, it will go through the baby's skin, okay? If you use all with perfume, you don't know whether your baby are allergy or not, right? So you will have to um, do some allergy tests and all those things, but we don't want that. We don't want to start uh, allergy 
we don't want to start an energy baby at a very early age. So uh, to be safe, we just use any edible uh, oil, yeah, any oil that you eat, so meaning that it's safe for your baby, right? Okay. If we do the face massage, we don't need oil because your face produces its own oil. Okay. But when you want to deal with uh, leg or hand or other parts of the body, it will you will need uh, some oil, okay, to prevent uh, traction, right? So first you have to take the oil, okay, and then we do this. We must ask permission from the baby before you start massaging your baby, right? So baby, you're going to have a start, make a start today, right? So we start with Indian nursing. You have to hold your baby straight like that, and then we start from the thigh to the leg, okay, to the feet. So this is what they call as Indian nursing, okay? What is the what is the pressure that you have to use for your baby? So you just pull your ear loop. If, it, if it, it's not that hard, okay, you just pull your ear loops and then you that is the strength that you use for to massage your baby. Alright? Then you will have thumb over thumb. That's it. Thumb over thumb. Okay. Then you will have toro. Parents who are interested to know more about infant massage, you can um, call me or write to me, okay? And I will direct my instructors to come and um, give you a one-to-one -one, uh, training, yeah? Then we will have under toes and ball of foot, where you put one finger under the toes and one finger at the, um, at the end here, yeah? All right? Then we will have thumb press, this press is, I don't know whether you can see this, I hope so you can see this, okay. this is thumb press, okay. then we go top of the feet, right? then we will have ankle circles, okay. use the thumb and the control, then we will have traditional things. It's exactly the same like Indian lifting but it's the other way around. When Indian lifting is you bring your the blood to the feet, but um Swedish lifting is to transfer back the blood to the body, right? Then you will have rolling. Okay. And you will have bottom relaxer. You just go like that and integration, right? So that's the end of leg massage, right? So now you can put your baby's clothes. Hey, how was your massage, baby? Do you enjoy it? Okay, with your baby feeling clean and fresh and comfortable and after having their massage, you know, it is time for a deep treat, right? So babies usually sleep better after a warm bath and also after the massage, right? So thank you baby for behaving very well during this session, right? So, um... So congratulations parents uh, on successfully bathing your baby, right? Practice makes perfect and all mummies and daddies can do it, right? And during this pandemic, just make sure every time you want to pull your baby, make sure you clean yourself first. Do not take your baby outside except for hospital appointments because they are very fragile and they can easily get infected, right? So stay home and stay safe everybody. Okay, and
All right. Thank you so much, Puan <laughs> Mazni, for yeah, that so. very, very thorough demonstration on proper bathing techniques for your baby. And I'm sure it will come in very useful for our mummies and daddies. So for our participants who want to learn more from Puan Mazni, you can find her on, so on her social media. Her Instagram is Mimi Zaino. Her Facebook is Mazni Muhammad, or you can check out her, uh, you can ping her on email or her phone number. So once again, thank you, Puan Mazni, for your time and your demonstration. And Welcome. thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you so much to our participants for your time. Thank you for uh, thank you for sitting in and listening, uh, listening in to our to our doctor's talk and for watching Puan Mazni's demonstration. And thank you, of course to Hagis for organizing this exclusive antenatal webinar. So for further information, please feel free to follow us on our Super BB Facebook page to keep updated on future webinars for you. So please have a pleasant weekend ahead. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, Pantani. Bye. Okay, we come to the end. If you like this video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and smash the bell, and then share it all away.